I like to keep it real. I think that's important. And you saying that sometimes you're not inspired, I thank you for that. Well, how could I always be inspired? I've been doing this. I've been in the guild since uh, 81. So wow. that's 42 years I've been in the Writers Guild. So how could anybody stay inspired that whole time? I've been all over the emotional map. And I do feel like creative creativity goes in cycles, but you can't always wait to be inspired. That's why you've got to just sit there. You got to put your butt in the chair and sit there. And it can be really painful. Welcome to the podcast, Rob and Schiff. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. I feel like it was a stroke of fate that I ran into you on the picket line at Fox last week. I know. I know. And that you were impressed that I remembered your part that got cut out. But of course, I wrote it. So I would remember it. <laughs> it must be personal when a role is cut from a film because it's one of your creations. It was the right decision. The uh, Romy and Michelle characters were a lot edgier in my play Ladies Room. And when they were expanded to be the central characters in a movie, they needed, they weren't going to be as outrageous. Um, so those particular scenes, they were scenes where Romy and Michelle were catty and mean to other people. And we took all that out. And how cool that it started from a play. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know? Did you just no. find that out? I, I just, the second. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was in the Groundlings Comedy Group. Yeah. yeah. I had uh, come up with a scene that was between two women uh, talking about getting, this was in the mid 80s, okay? So this was way ahead of its time. It was two women talking about getting respect in the workplace as they were transforming to go to a pickup bar. So the the subtext was as they're talking about getting respect, they're putting makeup on. We did a whole thing where we changed clothes in front of the audience at the Groundlings. So they didn't really see anything, but you felt like you were seeing stuff. Mm. And um, and that sketch became a one act play. And then Romy and Michelle were fillers in the play. That's unbelievable. And I have to ask, I know Lisa Kudrow was teaching at the Groundlings. Is that where you met? She, this was years before she was teaching. She wasn't even in the Groundlings. She was in the school. And I called a friend of mine, Tracy Newman, who is Lorraine Newman's sister and one of the founders of the Groundlings. And the very first, one of the backers auditions, I had two girls from the Groundlings do the backers audition, but they kept adding words and I did not like that as a playwright. And one of them was Kathy Griffin. And I was like, life's too short. No more Kathy Griffin. So I called Tracy Newman and I said, Tracy, do you have anyone in your class or do you know of anyone who would be good for these two parts? And she sent me Lisa Kudrow and a girl named Christy Mellor. And they both showed up wearing flower print dresses. Christy was probably a foot and a half shorter than Lisa. And Lisa's naturally a brunette and they had dark hair pulled back into ponytails and they just looked like best friends. And I randomly assigned Lisa Michelle. And one of the runs in the play was um, Romy saying, uh, Michelle saying, I have the worst taste in my mouth from those taquitos. I hope I don't get indigestion. Remember that time I barfed from bad Mexican food? And then the other one is like, I hate throwing up in public. And Michelle's line was me too. Lisa did it like this, me too. And showed me what I'd written. Because I kind of knew it was funny, but I didn't know it was as funny as it was. And once she did that, it gave me the idea to go back into the play and give them other things where one would say, I hate doing something gross. And the other one is like, me too. Like they <laughs> got a huge uh, coincidence. That is so adorable. What a story. So you came into Groundlings as an actor and writer? Well, I was a writer and I was a feature writer at the time. I didn't realize I was a, mostly a TV writer yet. 
And I went to the groundlings to get out of the house. I was isolated. I was home by myself all day. There was, you know, nobody that I was interacting with. And my shrink, I was depressed. And my shrink at the time said, we'll put you on meds. And this was back before everyone in California was on meds, including me. But I was like, no, I'm not going to be like, you know, McMurphy and in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And um, and I wasn't interested in sports or joining a charity or anything. And I'd always gone to see the Groundlings. As a matter of fact, I was thinking a lot about it with the passing of Paul Rubens. And when I first started going to the Groundlings, I saw Paul Rubens and Phil Hartman and a lot of people that didn't get to be that famous. Um, Phil was in my group and John Lovitz was in my group. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else you would know. Julia was right after me, Julia Sweeney. And, um, but anyway, Lisa was in the school. She wasn't even in the Groundlings yet. That's an unbelievable story. So you basically discovered Lisa. I did discover Lisa. I she was so Lisa. nice to me on set. I, I remember her telling me in the bathroom, oh, you're so funny. And I was just blown away that she said that to me. And it's so nice when a star is, is so generous to the people that come in with yeah, the smaller parts. Nice. Yeah, no, it's not, it, not for sure. I have stories. Um, okay, so moving on, absolutely salivating that you were executive producer on Emily in Paris. Can we yes. talk about that? Because of course. that is such an exciting show. My mom and I love to watch that together. Oh, how nice. Mm -hmm. Is she in LA too? She's in Boston. But you... What do you well? I travel back and forth a lot. I like see every month, and so we binged. And then when the second season came, we binged. And oh. she lived in Paris, and we just we love the outfits, we love her, we love the storylines. Tell me the inception of that project. Well, this was an idea that Darren had for about two Darren Starr, who created the show, he had for about two years, and he was procrastinating and procrastinating to the point where the studio was like, you have to give us our money back if you don't write this script. So he finally wrote it. And, um, and I was, he, he's, I'm just one of the people that he gives his stuff to when he's developing stuff. So I read it early on. And, um, and initially when he offered me a job on it, I turned it down because I was like, I don't know enough about the culture clash for it to be authentic. And I don't know about luxury goods and I don't think I'll be good on this show. So I uh, cut to about eight months later, he had a whole first staff that didn't work out. So he got rid of the whole first staff and then brought over all of his writers from the TV show Younger. So he had all those writers over as the second staff and I was in Europe with my friend, Winnie Holzman, who wrote Wicked. And all the writers had gone back to uh, the States except for one. And Darren called me and said, will you come to Paris? We don't have episode 10 and I really need help. And and I knew that I could help under those circumstances. Who, who couldn't? Who couldn't? <laughs> so I went to Paris for uh, a month stayed in an unbelievable hotel called Lutetia and had the time of my life because I got to come in and be a hero and be fresh horses for everyone. And um, and then after that, I saw that just the fact that I know what I'm doing and can break stories and have all these years of experience was um, what I needed to do the job. So then I came on full time. Oh, what a, what a fairy tale. It is uh a fairy tale. Tale. It's it's the best gig I've ever had, um, other than, you know, just working for myself. Right, right. I can't imagine what it was like shooting in Paris. Uh, the fashion is unbelievable. Um, that's such a big part of the show. Do you have a say in that? We don't have anything to do with that. That's okay. really between wardrobe and the actors. I don't even know, to be completely honest, if Darren signs off on it. He may, but I don't see him do it. So, um, yeah, it's really a collaboration between the 
costume designer and um and the actresses but yeah it's definitely a character in the show it is it is and i'm always wondering how she affords those outfits like they must pay her really well in advertising she she affords them the same way she can afford that apartment (laughs) yeah like she she's she's rent poor maybe yeah (laughs) like a lot of actors in la are car poor stuff like reality and emily in paris Right. (laughs) It's just, it's so delicious. And the romance. Oh, there's your cat. Yeah. What's your your cat's name? Marco. Marco. Cats must really wonder, like in the Zoom, you know, COVID time, I saw so many actors working with pets online and they have such interesting reactions. Some are very concerned about the actors, others you know, are intrigued and look in the screen. Uh, were you home all of COVID in, in your home where you are now? Was at home. I joked that I went, I went from my living room for a year to uh, the South of France. Cause we, you know, I was in COVID. I wonder if I can, can I screen share? You can, you can. Let me, let me just. It doesn't, do never mind. It's not going to be that interesting. It's a picture. Oh, it would uh, be. It would be here. Say now you can say. Go ahead. You can screen share now. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can find this. This is this is not an Emily in Paris thing, but this is just um, being in Paris. Eh, never mind. It's too too much of a hassle to do it. Are but you, you sure? Can, okay to the most popular museum there and there was no one there and oh so you were there during covid working I was on there the during show. covid it we we shot in the south of france remember how the second season began in saint tropez yes so we i went from my living room to to saint jacques cap ferrat which is where we were staying while they were filming down there and we were there for 2 weeks and then we went to paris and for another 2 weeks they were still having or another 10 days, they were still having lockdown. So we couldn't go out after seven o'clock at night. No restaurants were open. And then the day after it opened, it was just jammed. Like there was no such thing as COVID. People were just wall to wall in cafes. They couldn't wait to go out. Wow. That's incredible. I can't believe that you were filming. I'm curious. I I made a movie, um, a Henry Jaglum film in France, and we shot it in Cannes. And our working hours were crazy. We were, were we would have this lazy breakfast. Then we'd maybe shoot around twelve and be done by six. Is it like that still, no, no, or is it different? No, no, because I think we pay a lot of overtime. To be completely honest, because we have big shows and. Um, we, uh, I know we don't go insanely late like here, but it's not uh, just French hours. I, I do think we go over time. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I was wondering, that was the most delightful shoot. I have to say. My uh, very first script was optioned by Henry Jaglum. Is he still alive? Oh yes. He's alive and well. He was on my podcast. Uh, yes. What, what was the script? It was called Portrait of Friends, and it was about uh, two best friends. The woman always went out with musicians, and when they would break her heart, the guy was there to pick up the pieces, and he had an unrequited crush on her that she didn't know about. And she meets a lawyer and gets serious about him, so now the other guy has to shit or get off the pot. That was the basic idea. He optioned it, rewrote it, put his name on it, and that virtually ended our relationship but oh. I'm still fond of him you know well I'm happy to reconnect the two of you and in fact um I'll write you offline of an opportunity coming up soon where that could happen uh but yeah that's ouch ouch um <laughs> we have all sorts of experiences in this industry don't we yeah it's true and that was my first my very first thing that somebody wanted to option. I remember it was for $2,500 for like two rewrites. And this is, but this is 40 years ago. And my agents were like, you're crazy. Don't take that deal. And I was like, you don't understand. Somebody wants to pay me to, for my writing. So it was a, it was an interesting experience. It was a life experience. Yes. I had a life experience with him too. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I have a question, like being a woman in this industry, like you are like my genie in a bottle because I kept saying, where are all my female producers? I have so many male producers on this podcast. What is your experience and how is it in 2023? Well, I mean, you're out on the picket lines. You see how many more women there are. Although I don't know if you, well, you haven't been on another strike because you're SAG, but um between even 2007 and now there's so many more women i mean there's still we're still wildly underrepresented but there's so many more women and people of color now than there were 15 years ago and it's certainly changed you know it it just it needs to change more but it's changed a lot certainly since i was coming up there were not that many of us i bet that must have been really difficult uh, did did you have no, to advocate? Wasn't. Advocate? The, no. The thing is that they always needed a woman. So if you were a woman who men thought were talented and can get along with, you worked all the time. Mm. So I had um, three of my mentors. Two of them were, were a writing team called Ken Levine and David Isaacs, and I did a show with them in 96 97 called almost perfect that's still one of the best things i've ever done starring nancy travis if you know who she is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then um barry kemp who created coach and new heart uh put up the money for my play ladies room which became romy and michelle's high school reunion and he was another one and then um when i was doing almost perfect i'd been working for years, but re pretty much unproduced. I'd had a few things made, but nothing where I was involved with the production. They, uh, Ken and David treated me as an equal partner at the same time they were training me. And same thing for Barry. And I'm still good friends with Ken and David. And I'm still, I'm still working with Barry. We're doing a Romy and Michelle musical and I'm doing a sequel. You're doing a sequel? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do I get a second chance? I don't know. It'll depend what parts end up in the sequel. I'm kind of in the middle of rewriting it. Okay, great. Great. Maybe nose job girl, you know, has a resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking a friend to Disney to that screening, but you know, it's not the first time I did a one woman show and I literally acted out all the parts I had been cut out from. Oh, how funny. What a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it was called Sugar Happens. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I got to bring them to life, which was really fun. And I did talk about No Stop Girl in that show. I'll have to send you a clip. Um, okay, so you worked on Uncoupled with Neil Patrick Harris. That's fantastic. Right, another Darren show. Darren and I have known each other. We were social friends for about six or seven years before we started working together. And We've been working together on and off for uh, about 20 years. What a good partnership. Do you know my friend Clark Peterson? I don't. Okay. I know he's friends with Darren. Interesting. Um, so Robin, what keeps you inspired? I'm just, a, a, I'm just an addict. I'm a writing addict. I want to be good and I want to be better. And I like keeping my mind occupied. I like telling stories and... I just love what I do. So, but the real answer to that is sometimes I'm not inspired. And there's um, like a friend of mine has this thing for writers um, called the kitchen timer. And he works with a kitchen timer, sets it for, um, will you work for a minimum of one hour, a maximum of four hours a day and one hour chunks. You set the timer for an hour and you work in two different documents. One is the document you're working in. The other is like a writing journal. So you can spend the whole hour in the journal or you can go back and forth between the two or you can spend the whole hour in your project. But the idea is not page count or how much you're accomplishing. It's the getting your butt in the chair and sitting there. And that's the only way I know to deal with lack of inspiration. It's just to sit there. Interesting. Is the journal somewhat like the morning pages where you just freeform or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I have, I'm blocked. What the? 
<laughs> yeah. A lot yeah. of my journal has two trains of thought. One is I suck. I'm not talented anymore. And the other is I wish I'd eaten something before this hour started. I'm so hungry. I wonder what I have to eat. Should I go out or should I just scrounge in the kitchen? I suck. You know, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of that. I bet there's a script in there. I mean, that's a character's, you know, it's so subtext. Are you kidding me? If I was walking, if I was talking to someone at a cocktail party and they spoke like that, I'd make an excuse and get away from them Im immediately. But I think it's interesting to have a character who's not speaking and, you know, we hear their thoughts. Yeah. You know what? I teach acting and, you know, I'm always reminding actors like they're so on the line. I'm like, no, while you're saying that line, expressing that line, you're also having thoughts, you're looking around, you're having sensations. Yeah. There's so many multiple threads happening. And so I find that very intriguing what you're doing. And I, I like, yeah. I'm to do this thing during auditions that I thought was so cool. If actors were too, like you were saying on the line or, or just too memorized, he would give them a, a stack of headshots and say, while you're doing the scene, can you alphabetize this? Bravo. That's genius. And he would come up with different ways to sort of distract them so that, you know, hopefully to make it more natural. Yes, that is brilliant. I remember when I, my first acting school, the teacher had me eat a bag of Cheetos while I was trying to do an yeah. early scene. That was so fantastic. And so all the time I'm trying to break up people, interrupt them from, from that because we're crazy in life. We have so many things going on right yeah. this moment. I have thoughts going on, right? Oh my gosh. I have to put my fresh sheets on, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I'm an actress living in a studio and um, in my podcast studio, you know, I'm looking at my life right now and it's just, I don't know. I think it's, you know, my friend used to say to me, acting teacher Glenn Vincent, you know, when I used to waitress, like, you're so lucky you're flipping burgers because you're you're so in it. You're so in the real life of it. And Hollywood has kept me in it. Believe me, it has kept me in it. And so I like to keep it real. I think that's important. And you saying that sometimes you're not inspired. I thank you for that. Well, how could I always be inspired? I've been doing this. I've been in the guild since uh, 81. Wow. So that's. 42 years I've been in the Writers Guild. So how could anybody stay inspired that whole time? I've been all over the emotional map. And I do feel like creative creativity goes in cycles, but you can't always wait to be inspired. That's why you've got to just sit there. You got put your butt in the chair and sit there. And it can be really painful. Mm, yes. I know that with discipline, discipline and craft. Yeah. And that's why it's so tempting. Like today, I just wanted to run to Fox and get on the picket line because I couldn't. I said, no, Rachel, you were just on it yesterday. You're going to Paramount tomorrow. Like focus today. Uh, and that's that must you be know, a temptation. Tomorrow, Paramount is a big uh, military picket. Yes, that's why I'm going. Fun. That's why you're, are, are you associated with the military or you know what i i am very involved with veterans i'm an advocate for veterans my dad uh was a navy doctor and somehow by spiritual inheritance i identify very strongly with veterans so i teach veterans at sag after i'm on the military committee and i teach at vme veterans and media entertainment and now i also train um elected officials and candidates through new politics, which also is helping our veterans to run for office and continue their service. You know, I started a program. I started the program at the Writers Guild Foundation, the right, the veterans writing workshop. I started you that did? Wait. 12 years ago, had no interest in vets at all. I was on the board of the Writers Guild Foundation and the East Coast had had been left a bunch of money, which they were using to uh, do workshops with vets. Wow. And our group decided we wanted to start it in LA and I like to teach and mentor. So I, um, I volunteered to start it. And then of course, fell in love with the mil military vets. We just had our 12th weekend, uh, 12 years of weekends uh, about a month ago. And then we have follow-up for a year. And I know then that you know my dear friend, Greg Cope. 
I don't. Gre- he teaches there. Gregory oh, Gale. yeah, but we, we're all, especially with, um, with uh, doing it on Zoom. Oh, we you're all separate. We need any of the other mentors. I, oh, okay. We have five mentors in my group for six people. So many people want to do it. Wow. Well, it would be fun if I took my actor veterans with your writers to workshop. Yeah, that that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, that gives me a good idea, which is when, you know, maybe I'll have you guys read scenes or read through something out loud. That would be a great resource, Rachel, if you would want to do together. I would love to do that. I have wonderful women and men that I have trained and are are just, I, I really believe in them. All ages, all ethnicities, that would be a blast. Beautiful. I love that. I've done that. I see there's a higher purpose for this podcast. Oops, you sorry. Yes. So uh, I am going out to Paramount. Are you going tomorrow? Or are you writing? <laughs> I, I'm I'm writing. I, I may go. I haven't decided yet. Okay. Well, I'll be there. I am very excited. I did the Boston theme picket yesterday because I'm from Boston at uh, stu- in Studio City. But no, there's like it, there's an adrenaline uh, addiction to doing those pickets. And I feel like I was born to do this because I believe in labor. I'm an advocate and I'm loud. And uh, which you saw at gate three and uh, I get easily excited. So I'm perfect for pickets. I'm sure when the pickets are all over, uh, we'll be looking at each other and we'll be all isolated again. It was really interesting. The last time I was on the board and the negotiating committee in 2007 And there were these women that organized these fabulous like drinks and people would get together for drinks, but it would be like Jim Brooks and Robert Town and a bunch of young people and people of all different, you know, ages. And, um, and everybody was like, this is so great. We have to keep it up. And then it faded away. Mm, I know everyone goes back into their little clusters yeah. and, I, and I thought that I think that I'm walking around and I met I hung out well very briefly talked with Seth MacFarlane the other day and uh, I worked as an animation model at his company and we had this talk and I was thinking like Hollywood's not fair like it's very hard to have access to people in that way especially for actors and what a wonderful time where everyone's basically on the same playing field not financially but in a sense that we're not working and we're standing up for the same purpose. Right, right. So it'll be interesting to see what happens tomorrow when they go back to the table. I know. I know. I'm very interested what's going to happen and what how far along the actors will be after that. But I keep thinking, well, they're smart. They need the scripts first. They can wait on the actors. I was surprised that they didn't go to the actors first. I was really surprised. They, because... If they can settle with the actors, business resumes and the scripts are a problem for another day. I mean, I hope they don't watch this podcast, but not that they're not thinking of this stuff. But I thought that they would for sure want to punish the writers and make a deal with the actors. My friend who was an executive said that I think it's personal and that they hate us. And she said that they don't hate you and they don't think it's personal. But I think guys who are used to no one saying no to them do not like people who say no to them. Mm. Right, right. Such a power dynamic, isn't it? Um, I know I only have you for one minute left. Oh, no. Okay. Um, What's next? Well, I'm writing the sequel, which is okay. what's next. Okay, what's that's right. Romy and Michelle. a lot of Romy and Michelle. Romy and Michelle sequel, Romy and Michelle musical. And we're talking to a couple of different venues that may be interested in the musical. And the sequel has to get written by yours truly. Yay. Okay. I'm very excited. There's such synchronicity in all of this. And um, I guess, where can we contact you? If we want to find you, ask you a question, are you on social media? Not really. I, I'm on Facebook, but I don't um, accept friend requests if I don't know the person. So okay. no, I don't really do. Okay. Okay. Social Got media. that. No social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. No, 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 no. Okay. That's how you stay focused because you're not scrolling on your phone. That's not my thing. <laughs> Whatever. I'm like the opposite. I want less access to me. Mm. Okay. Like well, this- 
you know, I'm on, like a lot of writers, I'm fundamentally an introvert. So I definitely have an overlay of extroversion, but I'm mostly an introvert. I respect that. I respect that. And uh, in the final second, um, any, in, any advice for actors? Any advice for actors? I will say that I, I I really hope auditioning goes back to what it was and that you guys, it's really, really, really onerous on the actor to have to do all these tapes. I know producers don't watch the whole tape. They'll watch, you know, the, yeah, I know. You just like, no, you watch the beginning of it. If the person's not right, you go on to the next person. And I do feel like there's so much to be gained by it being in person but don't come in and chit chat, come in and do your job. Don't come in and shake hands with everybody. And how's your day going? And really just come in, say hello and perform and be ready to make adjustments. That's my advice. Yes. It's so clean and to the point. I love it. Robin, thank you so much for coming My today. Pleasure, it's all, and I'll see you on the picket line, hopefully for not that much longer. Okay. Yes. Hopefully. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Robin. So wonderful to have you on the podcast to reconnect. You're so inspirational and smart and funny, and we can't wait to see what you do next. If you'd like to hear more of my podcast, please visit my website at diaryofanactress.com. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. Until the next time, stay inspired. Au revoir!